talk about how to make uh, awesome command line apps with Ruby. Heard a little bit about that before. Um, so briefly, um, like I said, I'm Dave Copeland, DaveTron5000 on Twitter. Um, so I am currently an engineer at Living Social, and even though Living Social is a pretty big company, we still work in small teams. Um, and if you've worked at a startup or work on small teams, you know that being able to write a command line app is very useful, and you find yourself doing it a lot. So that's what this is about. Also, I'm writing this awesome book right here, which you should totally buy right now. Use all of the internet to buy this book right now. It's OK. Um, uh, but I promise I will only show this uh, one more time. Still working? Yeah, there we go. Um, OK, so uh, slightly more history. Um, I started off with Commodore 64, which is certainly a command line interface. Yes. Um, then in college, I did C, and I had a computer where the cursor keys didn't work in VI. So I learned that HJKL, like, really good. And so now, when I have to leave HJKL, it really angers me. So that's why I love doing stuff on the command line, because it's all right there. Of course, I did Perl, um, and then I used this hot new language called Java for a while. Um, and there was no IDEs at the time, so I wrote Java in Vim. And if I have to write Java now, I still do it in Vim and on the command line. And then started using Ruby. So. Uh, that's what this is about. Um, and just to be clear, right, there's no IDEs in there. I do not like them. I like it on the command line. I like gluing my tools together and all that that entails. Okay, so obviously I care about command line apps because I was born and bred and have no choice, and that's just how I am. But the rest of you maybe didn't have that upbringing. So why should you care? Um, so I'll demonstrate this with a tale that, is, that I've lived out many times and probably you have as well. So you're working on something, um, and there's some sort of emergency that you must fix. Like you're going to go to production with some new feature, and there's some problem. So you uh, make your, your little one-off script. You, know, you SSH through the gateway to production, and you're making your script that's going to save the day. And you run it with you know, you have no time to think of, of the command line syntax. Just run it and get it done. Done. All right. And uh, of course, you, know, you want to save this for later. So you put it into version control, because you, know, you might need it some other time. And uh, you know, you're, you're humble. Say, oh, I didn't save the day, I just automated a couple things, you know, done. So that's all fine and good, you save the day and you're a hero. Now, it is six months later, and uh, some ops guy comes up and he's like, hey man, you remember that script you wrote that one time? And you, of course you kind of maybe remember, because it's, it's been a while. So he says, there's a huge bug in it that you have to fix. I noticed your name is on version control, um, and uh, of course, I don't want to have to fix it right, I'm in the middle of, of doing something. Oh, and it's going to have to parse XML, so you've got to add some, <laughs> some new features to it while you're, uh, while you're in there. So uh, this exact thing has happened to me um, at, at least twice, right? Um, so you say, right, let's do it. Let's, let's fix this thing. Um, and so you run it, and uh, you get a random error that makes no sense. Maybe you gave yourself a help statement. You know, that would have been nice of you. Um, no, you didn't do that. Um, maybe dash dash help, right? That's a pretty reasonable way to ask for help. Okay, um, that probably didn't do what you wanted it to do. Um, but maybe you were in some alternate universe where you're like on Windows, right? And so you try that, and no, of course, that's, that's, that's no help. So to hang your head in shame and edit the source and figure out what's going on. So this kind of sucks. Because um, you're going to have to write command line apps, right? Like, there's no way to avoid it. You're going to have to write them eventually. And they have a tendency to become somebody else's job. Someone else will be running your command line app, unbeknownst to you. And since your name is on it, you're going to have to fix it or add features to it when something is going wrong, and it might not be the time that's most convenient to you. Right? And I'm not saying, like, save the whales. I'm saying future you. Be, you know, help, help yourself later on. Future you would have appreciated a better help statement or a couple of if statements in that, uh, in that script to be a little better. Also, it's worth pointing out that knowing how to use a command line uh, unlocks this uh, infinite way of, of gluing systems together and makes you a better developer. So. There is that too. And I guess that's also selfish because you can make more money being a developer. Okay, so what I'm saying is that even your one off scripts, you should make them awesome. Right? Because those script is one off, they, they, they have a tendency to live forever, and you want to be kind to future you. And fortunately for us, Ruby makes it really easy to make awesome command line scripts that are just as easy and fast to write as a bash script, if not better. So, what do I mean by awesome? So, an awesome app acts like it's a first class app plays well with others, and it is helpful. So we'll talk about what those mean. So first class. Is that working? Yes, yes. <clears throat> oh, there we go. OK. Uh, so a first class app is not, you, you can't make one by just installing some gem or applying some technique. 
to get attitude that you have to have, right? So your first attitude is it's not a script, it's an application. So you should treat it the same as you would treat any other application. Don't hack it together, don't treat it as a chore that you have to get through, treat it as a real application that you have to write and, and, and do like you would any other. So uh, how do you do that, right? It's, like I said, it's not some gem, it's, it's a series of decisions you make before you start. You decide it's gonna have a real user interface. You decide you're gonna use some good design and you're gonna write a little bit of documentation and you're gonna distribute it through some real distribution system. And all this stuff is really easy. You know, you're deciding to care about this application the same as you would your real application. Um, and uh, of course, if you decide this ahead of time, that's the best time to decide these things and it's actually not that hard to do it. So, number two uh, aspect of an app that is awesome, playing well with others. So, I would say an app that plays well with others, a command line app, uh, embodies the Unix way, which is this. Expect the output of every program to become the input to another as yet unknown program. Don't clutter the output with extraneous information. Avoid stringently columnar or binary input formats and don't insist on interactive input. That's pretty awesome. If every command line app acted like that, our lives would be good. So this is kind of vague. What does this actually mean? Uh, your output should be greppable. Like typical command line apps that process text like uh, have some thing that they're doing. And, and, and so if you keep that thing on a line by itself, you can use tools like grep instead to manipulate each record, each logical record of what you're doing. Um, you should make your output cuttable, which means that these records should, if they have fields, often they have fields, you want to delimit them with like a comma or a pipe or something like that. So you can use cut or awk to, again, break up and manipulate the output. And by you, I mean someone else, right? Because when someone else wants a feature, you can say, no, dude, you've got grep and cut, just do it yourself. Um, exit codes, right? If things go well, if your app did what it's supposed to do, exit with zero. If your app did not, then exit with non-zero. Um, this way, your app can be used in a pipeline or in some other script, and people can tell if your app did what it was asked to do. Finally, messaging. So if you are, the output of what your app is doing, right, the thing that it does should go to the standard output, and any messages that aren't that go to the standard error because the user can then redirect them to the right place and have more control over what's going on. So you might think this is obvious, but there's certainly some apps that don't, that don't do this. So here's an example. Um, it is called Maven. I don't know if anyone's used Maven. It is how Java developers build their tools. This is the command line syntax to run one test. Um, and here is the first of what will be three pages of output. Um, you'll notice there's all kinds of um, sort of enterprise log levels for our build tool. Um, and except for here, who knows why. Um, at least two developers realized this was unreadable because they put this like row of dashes, and then another guy decided a row of stars, but not the same number of stars as dashes. <laughs> who knows why. Um, and if, if you try to read this, none of this makes any sense. Copying nine resources, why am I copying? I don't know, who cares? The second page is more of the same, horrible. Um, there's an error in there if you're looking close, but don't worry, it happens on every Maven build and it's not actually an error. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, so then the third page, we finally get to some results, and again, we've got more developers putting dashes in their unreadable output, and some sort of quasi-readable thing that says our test failed, and we exited zero, right? Great, for success. Um, so uh, this means that, like, yeah. Uh, so Maven is very hard to uh, put into another system. It's very hard to to script and, and, and work with because it doesn't follow these basic rules. So an example of something that does play well with others, so continuing the theme of uh, applications that I can't stand, uh, we'll go with Subversion, um, which I don't like at all, but it's a great command line app. It's really well written. So here's a situation you, you get in with Subversion. You've got some conflicts to sort out. Now what I want to do is I want to edit the files that have conflicts, and then in Subversion, right, when you've done that, you have to tell it, hey, I fixed the conflict, so it's cool. Um, so I don't want to copy and paste that because I'm lazy, so um, I'm going to do this, right? I'm going to say, give me the stat, which we just saw, and then show me only things that uh, start with a C, which means they're in conflict, and then yank the second field of that, which is the file name, and set all that to VI to edit and fix, which we are now doing, and then we'll do the same thing to say, hey, Subversion, we're done. So if you worked with the developers of Subversion and you were like, hey, man, can you add this feature to let me edit everything in VI and then automatically resolve it? They would tell you no, you don't no, because you can do it like this. Because they've written an app that plays well with others and can be used and manipulated in ways that they haven't thought of. And that's what you want your apps to do so that when people want these features, you can just tell them to go do it themselves and you don't have to do it. Okay, third, be helpful. Um, so essentially, right, you want to help your users or you understand how to use and understand your app. We saw earlier 
um, how terrible it was to not have a help system. And you also don't want to punish the users when they do something wrong. You want to be helpful and be nice to them. Um, so here's an example. And so the theme of these examples are apps that I like a lot. Um, so LaTeX. I mean, I never would have gotten through grad school without LaTeX. It produces beautiful output, terrible command line app. You type LaTeX on the command line, which is a reasonable thing to do to figure out like how it works. And then you get put into this weird mode where you're supposed to start typing your article. And I, I, you can't save it, and I don't know why you, you I, don't, I, know, I don't know anyone that writes articles this way, but the only way to get out is Control-C. So if you try LaTeX help, then it puts you into this crazy mode where it wants to find the file help.tech, which it can't, and no matter how, how many times you hit Control-C, it will insist on trying to reload that file that it knows is not there. Until you hit Control-D, which is an emergency, emergency stop that produces a log file. Um, so that's not helping me at all. It's pretty terrible. Um, the man page is also amusing and, and how it describes itself, but we'll talk about that later. So helpful. Um, Git. I love Git, and Git catches a lot of shit for being hard to use and hard to understand. But it's actually got a really amazing help system. Um, when you type Git, right, does it check your entire hard drive into version control? No. <laughs> right? It gives you a nice help system. <laughs> Yeah, that's very that's very nice. Um, it shows you all the options that you can use in a big list of commands that I've snipped off of, of what you might do. And when you say git help command, it tells you help about that command. In fact, it gives you this whole huge well-written man, well -written man page. Okay. Git check out of Mike. How's that? No? Yes? Yes? No? How's that? That's it. Okay. Got the magic again. Um, yeah, so um, for, if, if you want your app to be helpful, it kind of depends on what sort of app that you're writing, right? So if you're doing like these Unixy, one, simple kind of one thing, one thing only apps, um, you're going to do it one way, which we'll see. And if you're doing, um, you know, like LS or Grab, if you're doing like a command suite, which Git is, is, is a command suite, there's all these different commands you have to give it to do stuff. So version, gem, they work the same way. Um, we'll do it another way. So let's see those two ways. For a simple app, um, when you type it again, you don't want to do anything annoying or destructive. Um, you just want to give the user a nice little help statement um, that says what the app does and maybe how to get more help. Um, when you do dash H, which you should accept as the help thing, then you should show the fuller help statement, which should be every single option that you take, uh, what the arguments mean, things like that. Um, dash dash help should do the same thing, because uh, users will expect both to work, and so why not be nice and have both of them work? Uh, for a command suite uh, like Git or Gem, when you type it, it's going to do uh, essentially what Git does, which is just dump out a list of what the available commands are and what are the globally applicable options, the options you can use with every single command. Um, and it should also have a command called help. And when you run your command, giving it the help command, it should do the exact same thing. The help command, though, takes an optional argument, which is the name of another command, and then it should show you the help of that command, including uh, you know, what it does and what all the options uh, and arguments are that are available. Um, so this, all this stuff is actually really easy with Ruby, as we'll see. Um, also useful error messages are pretty helpful. Um, someone asked a question yesterday, and this was kind of my response. Like, this is weak. You should never have this being output from your program. It's just, you know, just, just, just lazy. And uh, I was checking earlier, and you can use as many if statements as you want. So just keep using them until your code is not crappy like that. Um, you know, it's not, not that hard. <laughs> Uh, so, right, we could apply all that stuff to Perl or Python or C if we really wanted to. So what's so awesome about Ruby, I mean, I guess I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but it's worth, uh, it's worth pointing out, especially if you have a ordinary system like I had that uh, doesn't like uh, any language that isn't batch. Um, so I kind of touched on this later, so I'll go uh, a little bit quickly, but we've got all these high-level abstractions, right? You're used to writing OO code in your web apps, probably. So uh, seeing that in a command line app, it just makes it easier. You don't have to switch modes of, of how you're thinking. You don't have to go, oh, now I'm in procedural Perl, so how am I going to do it? And you're so close to the metal, right? You can run all these system commands, and I mentioned that yesterday. Um, and uh, I think we made the case it's fast to start up, but certainly faster than writing like a Java program or something. Um, and Ruby Gems is really painfully easy to set up, even for internal distribution, to package your gems and get them distributed. So you don't have to be checking out a version control or anything like that. The ecosystem, I mean, command line is part of the, the culture. Like, every, uh, you know, every library has like a command line aspect to it, you know, pretty much. And um, I also noticed that a lot of Ruby command line apps tend to be written with some era of of taste, you know, they're kind of nicely well done. So, it kind of motivated me to like want to make better command line apps because 
those who came before did such a good job. Um, and of course, there's tons of open source gems, and we'll see a list of them um, at the end uh, of some you know, things that help you make command line apps. And of course, there's lots of gems to do everything else. So whatever you think you need to do interface with some you know, web service, there's tons of gems for that. OK, so that was the theory part. Um, so now let's talk about like, something, uh, something real here. Um, let's see. So actually, so there's two signs of unawesome. Um, one oops, is, uh, can I not do that? Uh, all right. One is uh, being terrible at shelling out to the system, or so-called poor self-process management. So uh, here's, here's, a, here's a program that um, makes a backup of a MySQL file in a really cheesy way. Uh, so hopefully nothing will ever go wrong because I'm not checking anything. I'm not checking the error codes. Who knows what's going to happen here? Um, it's not good. Um, so this is how you should actually do it. Right? You should check those exit codes. I mean, I spent all that time talking about it. Like, you should check them. If you call, if you call out to something else, it's going to tell you whether or not it succeeded, and you probably want to know that. Um, you probably want to know the command that you actually ran, the exact command line syntax. I'm sure we've all come into work, and uh, our cron job failed for inexplicable reasons. And it would be nice to know what cron tried to do uh, that it couldn't do. Uh, similarly to output, the command outputs a bunch of stuff that might be useful, don't throw it away. Like, put it somewhere because you're going to need to look at it. Again, future you, what would future you have appreciated having to figure out what went wrong? Um, so uh, Ruby 1.9 has this open 3 library, which is dead simple, and so here's an example of using it. Um, you call capture 3 on a command, and it gives you the standard out of the command as a string, the standard error as a string, and the status, which is a process colon colon status, which will uh, let you figure out the exit code and that sort of thing. So if things are good, you know, we don't have to even say exit code equals zero, because right, we can just say success, and we're good to go. Um, otherwise, we're printing things out, and you'll notice that we're printing the standard error to our standard error, because where else would it go? And uh, you know, we're printing the actual command right, that we ran to our standard error again. So the cool thing about this is if you, ran, um, if you use this inside an app that you're running in cron, and you have redirected your standard output to, say, a log file, the standard error will be captured by cron and emailed to you only if there is any. So, i.e., you get an email from cron if things went wrong with all the information in it that you could need to figure it out. So that's cool. So, right, so you throw this in some method. Um, oops. Yeah, and then you get a nice script that, um, with a couple of if statements. Um, it's pretty bulletproof, but still pretty, pretty readable in terms of like, what it's doing and what commands it's calling. So basically, like, you don't have to do it that way. Do it however you want, but customize it somehow and throw in some gem you can use internally and then use that instead of percent X or backtick or system. Like, and then, then all your calls are bulletproof. They're all logged. You have everything available that you need, and um, it's really the same lines of code. So that is pretty cool. Um, now we're going to go to the second sign of unawesome, which is... Crappy user interfaces. Um, so this is much more endemic and problematic, and I, I don't know why, but I will say in, in, in learning about this topic, it's very hard to find all these gems. Like, try finding the main gem. I just learned about it a few months ago. It's impossible to find via Google. You have to just know that it's on GitHub somewhere, and it's in Ruby, and you can kind of find it if you do that. So uh, I kind of understand, but at the same time, hopefully uh, this, will, this will help you out a little bit. So here's how to make a, a crappy user interface for a simple app, right? Just start grabbing shit off of RV. Um, for a command suite, here's another way. Again, grab shit off of argv in a case statement. Um, you know, that's, that's not good. Because uh, if you're manipulating argv, that's not good. You're doing it wrong, and you're actually making more work for yourself. Uh, and so what's the problem with, with this? Other than that it's cheesy, it's, it's hard to maintain and enhance. So that means when someone else wants a new feature to your app, that you're going to have to do it. Um, you, you know, it's, it's hard to add complex features when you're just hacking argv. Right, harder for others to maintain as well. Um, and it's actually more work, as we'll see, than using some common open source libraries. So for simple apps, there's Option Parser. It's built in. We talked about it yesterday. So here's an example of it. If you haven't seen it, it's super powerful. It's more powerful than I thought, and it's, it's really great. So basically, you set up this block with Option Parser new, and inside that block, you're going to declare your user interface. And the first thing you must do, um, I'm saying must, you don't actually have to, but you should, is make a banner which says what your app does and how it's used. Very simple, very nice, because uh, in the Ruby community we have very clever names for our gems and you might not remember what they are, so having this description is pretty helpful six months from now when you don't remember your clever name. 
So uh, and then at the end, we'll see how we'll see how you specify the options and stuff. You just say op stop parse. It uh, grabs everything off of argv for you. Does the parsing. <coughs> so what happens then? So inside, all right. So inside this block here, you can do stuff like this. Um, so you just call a series of calls to the on method. And so this says that it'll accept the flag dash dash auto. And its documentation is that it, it means auto regenerate. And inside the block, the block gets called if the user specifies this on the command line. Um, and here we're just setting an options thing. You can do whatever you want in there, whatever makes sense. And so you can also do negatable switches. So if you do this like uh, the square bracket no dash around there, that means that dash dash auto, if the user specifies it, will cause true to be sent to this block. And dash dash no dash auto will cause false to be sent to the block. So you can make this really um, fluent user interface, which is um, really handy for, especially for cron jobs, where you can see exactly what the app is supposed to do. Um, to accept, a, uh, for flags, where you need to accept an argument, um, you just tell it, you just, you just put the name in there, and that will tell option parser that this thing takes an argument. And in this case, um, you can put any number of these things in here, and so that means dash s takes an argument, dash s server takes an argument, here's the documentation, and then the argument gets passed. <coughs> um, and then here you can see an um, example doing some sanity checking. Again, you can do whatever you want in here, and so we can just you know, kind of barf if we don't like the value. And now, option parser can do a lot of, a lot of other uh, sanity checking for you. So if you pass a regex in, then the, uh, the argument must match that regex, or it won't cause the block to get called. So um, that's pretty awesome. You can be guaranteed that IP is going to match that regex. You can give it a list of uh, allowed values. You can give it a map where the keys are the allowed values. Very cool. And for doing all of that very, really minimal work, you get this awesome help statement, right? Yes, right? Formatting this is a huge pain in the ass, and option parser just did it really nice. And dash dash help works, right? So, so you're, you're good to go there. Um, now, option parser uh, is uh, easy for others to modify. When you see an app that's been written with option parser, it's very easy to modify it, which means someone else can take care of that for you while you do other things. Um, and it's built in with Ruby, so there's nothing to distribute. There's really no excuse not to use this. Except if you're doing a command suite. Option parser is not well suited. It's kind of a pain to get it to work for these command style interfaces, especially if you want something like kind of complex. Um, so there's several options. We'll talk about one that I wrote called GLI, because I'm giving the talk, so I can say, choose the gems. But I'll give you a list, of, to be fair, later of other ones. Um, so it's basically made to make a command suite app just like the one uh, that I was describing. Um, so the idea is you want to have a very polished UI without doing any work, um, and also bootstrap things, because I don't want to type either. So let's see what it looks like. Let's, let's say we're going to make a uh, to-do list app. So we'll install GLI. And then we're going to make a to-do list app that takes three commands, new, list, and complete. So we bootstrap it um, with the GLI init command. And we have a pretty reasonable like Gemify project that we can start working in. Um, so the first thing we'll do is uh, we'll run the app. And we can see that we get this nice help system already formatted for us. Obviously, you know, it's boilerplate text, but all the help stuff is there. It shows us all the commands. Very easy. Um, and then we, we do help and a command. We get you know, help specific to that command. Nice. So all the command and option parsing is done, uh, the complex help forming is done, and you get a boilerplate project. So here's what it looks like. Um, I think I ripped this off from the GitHub gem. Um, it's also sort of like rig, I guess, and that you kind of describe things and then declare them. So here we have a, a global option called dash f that has a default value. Um, here we have the command list, and then inside the command block we declare the uh, uh, options that are specific to that command. So the list command takes a dash l, but other commands don't. Um, and then finally, we have this action block here at the bottom. And the action block will be called when uh, the user executes this command. So the action block gets the global options that were specified, the command specific options that were specified, and any other arguments that were unparsed from the command line. And you can do whatever you want. So when we fill this all in, uh, we get a nice looking app that has a nice looking help system um, without a whole lot of effort. So essentially, we can just focus on what we need to do. So some other cool features. Uh, you can check it out there. So option parser and GLR are just two examples of dead simple polished UIs that you get. Um, you can spend time working on what your app does and not formatting the help text, or as the case may be, not formatting help text because you skip that part when you don't have a tool to help. Um, then you can easily maintain the documentation so future generations will know what your app does and how to use it. Um, so there's a ton of other CLI gems. I'm going to go through them really quickly here. Um, AKA command line app Safari. 
so for parsing, we saw option parser, we saw GLI. There's Thor, which is very popular, um, which is a similar thing to GLI. Uh, Trollop, uh, which is used by Cucumber, um, does both kind of apps, which is pretty cool. Um, Methadone, which is something um, I wrote, uh, lets you use simple apps and also has support for testing and bootstrapping and for interacting with the user, if you must. Uh, Readline is built into Ruby, and it's just like Unix Readline, so you can make a, a prompt with tab completion, very cool. And Highline is a sort of DSL for interacting with the user, um, asking them things, getting info from them, putting it back out. Uh, terminal tables, if you want to make um, cool little formatted ASCII tables, like if you want to make your own SQL client, like that's really easy to do. Um, Rainbow is one of about a thousand gems to color your output. Um, it's I guess the first one I found when I searched, so now I use that um, if you want cool colors. Uh, so testing and documentation. So Aruba is really awesome, right? It's, um, you can test your command line app with Cucumber, and Aruba provides a bunch of Cucumber steps that uh, are tailor-made for running a command line app, like checking the status codes, checking the standard error contains stuff, those sorts of things. Gem man lets you install man pages with your gem and then read them, and then the user can read them which is super cool until you realize that NROF kind of sucks. But then there's RON, which lets you write your man page in Markdown instead of NROF. So you can write like really nice man pages and have them totally distributed with your gem. Um, so, right, that's a list. Anyway, this, this will be up later if you guys want to check it out. And please tell me if there's anything I'm missing, because I always like to hear about new uh, command line stuff. Um, so making an awesome command line app is really easy. Because Ruby makes it simple with its awesome language and awesome tools that it comes with. Um, so to, yeah, some of those tools make it really fast to do what you want to do. Um, and future you would really thank you if you use these things the next time you had to throw together a command line app. Um, so if I'm missing something here, or if I'm wrong, which I doubt, but it's possible, um, please let me know. As I said, the last shill for my book, it's in beta right now, which means that you can totally buy it right now and tell me that things are wrong or messed up, and I will fix them. So that's really helpful for me, because um, I want to make this as good as possible. Um, so that is it. Thank you. Um, and I guess we have a two minutes and 50 seconds for questions. If anybody has any. Um, Maine. Yeah, yeah, Maine. I forgot to put that on the slide, but Maine is, Maine is pretty cool. Have you tried to do this on Windows? Uh, you know, um, unbeknownst to my wife, she has a full Ruby install on her laptop, and uh, uh, I did try this on Windows. Um, most of this stuff does work, like the exit codes actually work, um, this is in Windows 7. The exit codes work, standard error, standard out actually works, redirecting actually works. Um, I was pretty surprised. Um, so the hope is that um, all the stuff that I talk about in the book will, will work on Windows or will have a footnote that says, well, this doesn't quite work. So. Um, next time she's out of town, I'll, uh, I'll test it out. <laughs> so the question is, have I reused stuff on uh, command line gems for anything else? Um, I haven't really. Um, I mean, I guess you know. I guess if I'm, if I'm, it depends on what a command line. Because you know, if I write like some sort of uh, worker in my Rails app, it's technically a command line app, and I might use it there. Um, but you know, inside like a Rails app, I haven't so far. All right, cool. Well, thank you guys.